But we will see over and over again, it is the gospel to which we are called. It is the gospel in which we are called to live. It is the gospel we are exhorted to stand in. It is the gospel we are trying to spread. Those of us who are parents dare not take for granted the fact that our children, because they have sat in services like this for a number of years, understand what the gospel is. As parents, as grandparents, we're, we're not simply trying to pass along human tradition or self-made religion. We're trying to pass along the gospel. And if your teenage son or daughter stopped you in your tracks one evening and asked you that question, Dad or Mom, I know that this is important to you, and I continue to hear so many things from so many different people around me. Why don't you tell me? I want to believe this for myself. I want to make this my own. What is the gospel? What an amazing opportunity. Would you be ready to answer that question? And answer it biblically. What is the gospel? We know many of us have heard for many, many, many years the gospel is good news. But good news of what? What does that mean? And our aim for this evening is very simple. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we're so very thankful that you're here. And we want to do our best to root everything we say this evening in what God has said. So that as you leave here, you can know when God uses that word, this is what he means. If you're a part of another church in the area, we appreciate very, very much you taking the time to visit with us. And what we would encourage you to do is compare everything you hear this evening with God's word. That is our aim. For those of us who are members of the body of Christ. We refresh ourselves on what is most fundamental to our faith so that as we go out into the world and as we have been called to serve as the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that we're able to answer this most important question at a moment's notice. Being ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us gentleness, and respect. Turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. We reference this grand passage of the, the, the Spirit of God encouraging, inspiring Paul to write yesterday. We want to revisit it in its larger context. This is one of those grand, sweeping, encompassing passages of Scripture that perfectly sets us on our course for this evening. What is the gospel? We want to look at six key words this evening. And the first of those is a plan. When we're talking about the gospel, it's important for us to understand that the gospel is a definite plan. Number one, that comes through loud and clear in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. These are the words of God. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. These people were blessed because they were in Christ. And now they were enjoying every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. They were very much alive, just like you and just like me this evening. But they were recipients of the blessings of God because they had come to be in this state where God would describe them as being in Christ. That was the present. And now Paul takes them all the way back. Even before Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, even before God said, let there be light. In verse 4, God shows us in him before the foundation of the world. God had a plan. Even 
even before Adam and Eve walked this earth, even before sin entered into the world, before there was sin in the hearts of men, there was grace in the heart of God. There was a definite Amen. plan in the heart and the mind of God. And that plan involved people. And at the crux of that plan is the idea that people would be holy, like God is holy, and blameless before him. In love, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. God had a definite plan. That plan involved all of these things coming together in the language of verse 6 to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption. You see, on our own, we are holy. On our own, we are not blameless. On our own, we do not walk with God. We are alienated from him because of our sins. That's what we read in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is going to be revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. But here were real life people like you and like me in the city of Ephesus whom God could look on and say, these have redemption. Paul could write to these people and say, we have redemption. A price has been paid to bring us back to God. That price involves the blood of his son. It grants the forgiveness of our trespasses. This is the idea of a town crier or a herald coming into a town that is absolutely doomed because of rebellion against the sovereign king. And everyone in that town knows they deserve the wrath of the king. But the town crier comes in and says, hear ye, hear ye, the king is willing to grant ransom, forgiveness. The king is willing to extend his gracious hand of reconciliation according to the riches of his grace. Verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. Something has been made known according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan. So when we talk about the gospel, the gospel, the word itself means news. It is news of a definite plan. It is not the plan of any man. It is the plan of God. The plan of God for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Things in heaven and things on earth. All over the New Testament we read this kind of language. Ephesians chapter 1 is this grand, sweeping, deep, rich exposition about the mystery of God that was now being revealed. It is described much more succinctly in passages like Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. Peter stands up and he proclaims this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Why is it that Jesus was crucified? How is it that Jesus was killed by the hands of lawless men? Peter and the rest of the apostles want to make something very, very clear. It is not that Jesus stumbled into Jerusalem and unwittingly was betrayed and somehow snuck up on and arrested and brought before these authorities against his will. And somehow this all involved God, but 
people, lawless people, somehow foiled the grand scheme of God. Not at all. The reason Jesus went to Jerusalem was because it was a part of the definite plan of God. <coughs> Jesus was crucified. He was lifted up and killed by the hands of lawless men in accordance with the definite plan of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, Paul says, Christ died. He died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. You and I would refer to those as Genesis through Malachi. The Old Testament, God's great written revelation to mankind, revealed hundreds, sometimes thousands of years beforehand, elements of the definite plan of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul identifies himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, called to be one sent, set apart for the gospel of God. When we talk about the gospel, we're talking about news, and most fundamentally, we are talking about news of the definite plan of God. If you ever have the opportunity to answer that question, what is the gospel? I would suggest to you here is a wonderful place to begin. God had a plan. Number two, you turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. God had a very definite plan that involved a very specific event in history. What is the gospel? Number one, it's a definite plan. Number two, it is an event in history. We're talking about God working in space, in time, at a very definite event in history. Paul describes, he uses the word gospel in this sort of context in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. He says, now I would remind you, brothers. This is Christians. These are Christians. And he has had so many corrective things, some of them very hard things for these people to hear and apply and, and live in. And now in 1 Corinthians 15, he's pointing their focus forward and he's going to encourage them by the end of this chapter to be steadfast and immovable and always abound in the work of the Lord. Know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He's going to the press false news that the Christ has already come, or he's not going to come at all. In fact, maybe he was never even raised from the dead. Paul is going to absolutely smash, tear down that argument and encourage these people not to give up. But where does that begin? By reminding them of the gospel. You lose sight of the gospel and you lose your hope. You lose sight of the gospel. You, you act as if you've outgrown the gospel. And you fail to be steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so Paul's going to get there. But he begins in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1 by saying, I remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive, in which you and by which you are being saved. That's why this is an important question this evening. Because it is the gospel that we receive. It is the gospel in which we stand. It is the gospel by which we are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. 